What's up, Gamer God? This is Kyo Kusagani, bringing you the only complete playthrough of the Ghosts and Goblins prototype on YouTube. If you'd prefer to watch the video without commentary, there's a link in the description to the unvoiced edit. This footage was meant to accompany a larger project comparing all the arcade versions of Ghosts and Goblins known to exist. But A, that's going to take some time to build, and B, I noticed there wasn't any YouTube footage of the prototype beyond level 1 as of December 2022. A wonderful website called The Cutting Room Floor documented all the changes with text and images. But now you can spot all the differences in one concise video. You are welcome. It also allows me to point out mundane changes that aren't major enough to warrant mentioning in a documentary like the frog transformation sound. I jumped a little bit too early, so I grew a pair of delicious, nutritious frog legs. Mmm. More interesting is being able to backtrack further than you're able to in the final game, which can make the first gargoyle encounter significantly easier depending on its movements. I guess Capcom was concerned they'd make their Red Menace seem lamer than it is if you could keep your distance so easily. The time limits are also slightly more generous on average, giving you about 30 extra seconds or more per checkpoint. The hurry up bells also don't exist, which is either a buff or a nerf. Ask your eardrums if they're okay getting spooked by sudden alarms. Now we have a major change. The victory theme when you kill a boss, or lack thereof. It's a crying shame they cut this great jingle out. I think I know why, too. If you're not fighting two bosses at once, it always gets cut off by the sound of the key appearing. Which is unprofessional audio mixing by definition. But there's another possibility exposed by the end of level two. The boss music stops and it reverts back to regular music when you kill one of the two unicorns at the end of this village. I would not be shocked in the slightest if it would have been an enormous pain in the butt to fix that bug, seeing as they still had to work on two entire levels before the game was ready to go. Here we have the famous dilapidated mansion without any walls. I don't need to tell you the mansion redesign was one of the biggest renovations made during this game's development. I will spout some fun facts though. Most home conversions of G&G &G do their best to recreate the maze in the final game, but it's really funny to single out the MS-DOS version. It unintentionally restored the prototype mansion since those developers cared so little about accuracy. They drew the wall graphics and everything, but decided to make it scenery instead of an obstacle. It's a poetic metaphor for that port's quality, only reaching prototype status compared to Capcom staff. To be fair, MS-DOS is low-hanging fruit, nowhere near the capabilities of a custom arcade boy. But the Japanese PC-88 is too. And the developers of that port were able to make a faithful adaptation of GNG &G with no cuts. If you're talented, you can work magic with ludicrous limitations. There's the music bug I theorized earlier. A quick disclaimer before we march on to level 3. I took the liberty of cutting my second death from the video, as it was redundant footage that made the commentary needlessly padded. That being said, we're in super unfinished territory now. The bats that are supposed to be clinging onto the ceiling are levitating, and the gargoyle at the top of the level gets pooped out of the floor at the beginning instead. I'm going to steal the cutting room floor's theory on the misplaced ceilings and bats. They believed the ceiling was going to be much lower before Capcom got the idea to add a few ladders in to prevent straight line level design. And what we're seeing is the transitional period between the two ideas, wrong enemy placement included. The rest of the level past the checkpoint is mostly finalized, pardoning the missing armor and the absent dragon lair. 
Not counting the visual bug that makes the rest of the level invisible, this is the point where the game would reveal it was going to be even more shamelessly sadistic before it was tamed. If it weren't for the two gargoyles here. Just like the final game, they prevent any other enemies from spawning for balancing purposes. The gargoyles being smarter than the average enemy is. To that I say, smarter doesn't mean deadlier. Look at this shit show! I'm still stunned I was able to record such a clean run full of godly dodges. To think there were going to be triple the amount of imps until someone put their foot down and said no. Thank God for that playtester. My usual tactic for this part is to despawn the gargoyle by running back down the hill. But since there's nothing stopping you from running to the exit, I was better off keeping it alive to hold off the impending swarm of enemies in the prototype. Our success, of course, leads us to a bottomless pit we can't avoid since the level isn't finished yet. Wah, wah, wah. That isn't the end of it, though. By using the power of cheats, we can take a glance at the fourth and final level on this ROM. You'll need the level skip cheat to enter, and you'll also need to turn moon jumps on for the first half. These platforms don't work very well. They tend to get stuck and change direction for no reason, desyncing the pattern. As for the rest of the level, this is living proof Ghosts and Goblins was intended to be harder than it turned out. You may have just speculated the more aggressive enemies in level 3 were a work in progress, but this has deliberate enemy behavior that suggests otherwise. The imps coming out of the lava can throw fireballs at you in this version. That would have been a nightmare on top of having to deal with the flaming fire geysers and the dragon, which actually exists here. Give it up for God Dodge number two. I was on a roll when I recorded this. Unfortunately, my luck ran out twice before I was able to get through. Our death reveals more evidence the game was meant to be harder, though. Look at how far back the checkpoint is. This was moved to the middle of the bridge, which alleviates some of the luck demanded out of you up until that point. Nothing solves the spawn killing, though. Capcom really should have rethought this entire level because they applied band-aids to a tumor. It's still a luck fiesta. Just one that's ever so slightly less hateful. With the only thing left being the Mighty Dragon, I'll close my commentary here. I'd like to thank Pembroke W. Corgi for the devilish firebrand sketch he did for this video's thumbnail. And I will leave you on a hilarious glitch that happens if you game over when the key appears. Thank you for listening, watching, or both everyone. See you next time.